I'm going to be passing out a couple objects. I want you guys to be able to really easily pass it over. Thank you for that. So how's everybody doing today? That's good. Okay, so my name is Alex. Uh, I'm here from iMaker. Now, iMaker, we're a 3D printing store. Now, what we do is we sell all types of 3D printers. We offer 3D printing services such as scanning, design, uh, and also printing for rapid prototyping. Now, um, this is kind of just the basis of our website, really. You can kind of see we have different printers, uh, scanners, different kinds of materials also to use for it. Now, today, I'm going to be going over 3D technology, so kind of what we work with. Now, there are different kinds of 3D printing technologies. We'll start off with going through each one, uh, and we're going to be mostly focusing on FDM printing, which I'll get to in a bit, okay? So now, the first kind of 3D printing we're going to start with, uh, and go over here. Now, the center at Lisa machine, this is just one of our 3D printers that we work with. Now, it's an SLS style of printing. So basically, um, you're working with a bed of powder uh, and essentially using a laser to center it. The it's using nylon, so like a, a bed of powder of nylon, using a laser to center and build your object out of kind of a, a bed. So let me play the video so it's a little easier to explain. So this is just kind of uh, the process. This is kind of what the printer looks like. You have him using the nylon powder that you're starting with. You're pouring it into the bed. So it looks a little more, uh, it's hard to kind of see, but the bed is towards the back end of it. So you can pour nylon into it or whatever material you're using for an SLS printer. Uh, and essentially, it's a little harder to see, but the printer is using, a, when, as soon as it's closed, it's going to start using a laser and essentially melting and centering whatever part of the object you have that you want to make. Uh, so now this style of 3D printing, at the end, you're kind of left with uh, a bed of powder that's unsolidified and then what the laser solidified. Now this style of printing is good uh, because it allows you to do very complex objects because really uh, you're not really worrying about any kind of support structures because the bed itself of powder is actually support structures. You kind of just go through the process of actually cleaning up a 3D print uh, after it's done. Uh, this is just glasses in this case but it is a little kind of a tedious process but for this style of 3D printing it allows you to do some of the, the, the best materials. Now I have an example right here this is just a, a double Mobius strip that you can kind of pass around so you can feel it. Now, it is a little flexible because nylon tends to have that properties at the smaller level. Uh, but yeah, so that's just more one example uh, of 3D printing. Now, SLS printing, now this kind of printing, it not only uses uh, nylon, you can also use it for metal. Um, so you'll see a lot of the more industrial uh, printers that are, you know, like GE's using to make aircraft parts, and whatever it might be, they tend to use like, you know, uh, direct metal laser centering. Now that just means it's instead of using uh, a nylon powder using metal. It tends to get a lot hotter uh, because it needs to be able to melt this uh, metal, but it, that's kind of more the uses that it's for, not really prototyping at the lower consumer level. Um, so the next example of 3D printing we're gonna go over is resin printing. Now, resin printing is good for smaller, very intricate objects. Now, it can go large scale, uh, but it's usually not the best for that. So this is one of the resin printers we work with, the Gizmo Pro. Um, now, essentially, the way this works is, let me stop it there before I continue. Uh, you're working with a vat of liquid resin. Now, this, uh, essentially, this liquid resin, you can either have a projector or a uh, laser. They, a lot of ones work different ways. Essentially, you're using some kind of projection system to project light at this, at this vat of resin and cure it using UV light. Now, uh, we're going to kind of go over it so it's a little easier to see uh, and explain while it's, it's going. So this, in this case, we're going to be using a projector. Now, the great thing about using a projector is essentially you can project each layer uh, and build, uh, you can project essentially each layer so you can have multiple objects on each layer and it doesn't change the time because uh, you're not really worrying about a laser going piece by piece. So let's continue. So essentially, it's a little hard to see, but you're seeing an object essentially built out of the resin. Those uh, highlighted parts that you see right there, that's actually the resin being cured while it's going. So now this resin printer specifically is made to go very fast. Uh, it's, most resin printers, you know, for a ring or something like that can take anywhere from half an hour to two hours, just to give you an idea of what, what you're working with here. Uh, and essentially the build platform is moving the hardened cured resin upwards as it continues to build the lower levels. Uh, so I have more examples of resin printing right here as the video continues, but it is for highly intricate pieces. They tend not to have uh, as much strength as traditional other 3D prints, but there are some more resins that are coming out that allow you to do uh, flexible materials. Uh, they can do hardened materials, but it's, it's more for that tiny mi microscopic scale uh, of prints. Okay, uh, and then the next type of 3D 
printing that we're going to go over, this is really what we're going to be focusing on here because it's what's most commonly used, is FDM printing. Now, uh, FDM printing, that stands for uh, Fused Deposition Modeling. All that means is it's kind of like a hot glue gun, if you can imagine, on a chassis. So um, I have one right here. Let me unplug this and kind of move it where it's easier to see from you guys. Um, let's see if the mic goes that way. So this is just an example of a very, very basic 3D printer. Okay, this is our start printer. It's $99, kind of more to get people to understand the basics of how a 3D printer is built and how they work. Now we're gonna go over parts. Now, when using FDM machines, they're essentially using this extruder right here. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there are fans. Essentially, there's something we call a hot end. Now, what this hot end does is uh, it takes the plastic that's usually wired up on a spool called filament uh, and essentially melts that plastic. Usually, the temperature is anywhere from 170 degrees all the way up to 280, uh, depending on the type of material that's used. Uh, now, these are hard thermal plastics that you're using. There are a variety of uh, different kinds of plastics, and new ones are coming out every day. Uh, the most common two types, I'd say, are PLA and ABS. Now, PLA is a kind of a, a biodegradable corn-based plastic. Uh, it's probably the easiest one to print with. The quality is okay. You know, it's really just a basis and standard for just getting quick prototypes out. Uh, ABS is kind of very similar to what's being used in current manufacturing. So for like uh, injection molding and uh, different methods like that, almost everything we have that's plastic most likely is made through injection molded. Now that's what ABS is made out of. It's a little more temperature sensitive. Uh, it requires higher temperatures, a uh, heated bed and enclosure because essentially when you're printing, you don't want a lot of uh, temperature temperature uh, fluctuations in the environment of the printer because the plastic is trying to melt and build upon itself. So having any kind of temperature uh, change would ruin that. Now, essentially, let me continue back to where I was going. So when you're building uh, an object, essentially it's melting the plastic and building the object layer by layer. So we can kind of go over some of the examples so you can kind of see. Uh, when you look at these objects when it gets to you, essentially you can kind of see that they're all, uh, has a lot of lines on it. Because basically this object is building each it's kind of like, if you can imagine an object being sliced up into like a thousand, a thousand different uh, slices and it's building each slice layer by layer. Now, uh, they tend to be anywhere from about 100 microns to about 400, depending on what you're printing. I've seen some printed about three millimeters to get large, high, uh, high uh, volume uh, prints out. But that one itself was about 100 microns, so you can kind of see the quality. Now, we're going to go over a couple of the other kinds of materials that you can use with these printers. Okay, so give me one second. So like I said, PLA and ABS were the most common types, but there are other types of materials for different properties. Um, so one that we're gonna kinda look at is PETG. Now PETG is common, a combination of PLA and ABS. It does have transparent properties, so for uh, pieces where you need to be able to get light through an object, PETG is really cool for that. Uh, it does have, uh, it's pretty strong, not as strong as ABS, uh, and it's a little harder to print than PLA, but it has the perfect combination of both of those. Um, let's go over just a couple more. So these are just more examples of 3D prints that we can pass around. Now, one of the more popular materials that people are using is uh, nylon. Now, uh, we use a, co a company called Tallman for most of our nylon, but they're different types. Uh, nylon, I don't know, uh, how many of you guys are familiar with it? It's very popular uh, plastic. Essentially, it's, it's very strong, so for very functional pieces that you need a bracket and you need to have the absolute most strength and also have some flex to move between, nylon is always a good option to choose and look at. Um, it's a little harder to print than most materials as that happens with uh, industrial uh, materials, but uh, nylon is a really good uh, uh, object for that kind of stuff. Another material that is also very popular, it's called, uh, it's basically a TPU. So it's a flexible material that allows you to kind of create structural brackets, but also have a, an extreme amount of flex. So when you're passing this around, you can kind of like try and pull this and break it, it's not gonna work. When you look at the uh, 3D, I don't know if you guys have heard, they made a 3D printed car uh, using mostly ABS, uh, but for a lot of the bumpers and flexible parts of the car, they used a TPU similar to NinjaFlex, if not that same one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very strong, tear resistant, good for objects that you need that kind of properties. Uh, it, that specifically is NinjaFlex, but it's a TPU, so that's a, it's a, just a flexible plastic. Yes? Yeah, these are also the materials I'm going over right now are all FDM printing. Oh, sorry. Um, he asked uh, if nylon and all, uh, flexible materials can all be printed on an FDM machine. Now, 
yes, these materials can all be printed on uh, FDM machines, some a little harder than others, and you need like you know the right environment. So for example, we can look at nylon. Uh, nylon, uh, it doesn't need it, but it very, helps a lot to have a heated bed. Uh, and when you're working with a material that's a little temperature sensitive, similar to nylon, you want to have it enclosed in some way. So some people, you know, make enclosures out of IKEA tables if you need it. It doesn't need to be fancy. Other printers come automatically with an enclosure or a HEPA air filter. Okay. Um, but yeah, so those are some of the main types. There are, you know, new materials that are coming out, you know, for more of the aesthetic. Because some of this prototyping that's being used is really not functional. Sometimes it's just, okay, I'm going to make this in a, in a large, expensive material. But before I do it, I need to see what it looks like in a cheaper, faster way. Uh, so you have materials. These are uh, more congregates is what we call them usually. Uh, essentially, it's plastic mixed with another material. So you can't really print metal with these printers, with FDM printers, because they tend to require very high temperatures. So now a congregate material, all that is, is you essentially you're mixing, whether it be uh, metal powder, uh, wood powder, whatever it might be, with the plastic. So when you're printing it, you're not actually melting the, the wood nor the metal, you're melting the plastic surrounding it. It allows you to get, you know, a, mic, uh, a material that has the aesthetic look of, you know, like copper, bronze, or silver, but in actuality, be, uh, plastic. That one specifically uh, is from a company called Filament that we uh, work with. Essentially, that one's actually 80% copper. So while it still may not be as strong as just traditional copper, it's just pretty cool to be able to print a material similar to that to give it the aesthetic, give it, and Technically speaking, it has some functionality of it. You know, there are some materials out there that you can actually rust if you need to. There are ones that have magnetic properties. Uh, there are materials similar to carbon fiber. So you can actually print, you know, very sound and, and uh, strong parts if needed. You know, it might never be as strong as regular injection molding, but you can get these parts to hold your own weight. Okay? Um, but kind of go over more of the application-based stuff. So this is ABS. I didn't think I passed anything around. So you kind of see ABS more by its matted finish. Uh, PLA tends to be a little shinier, or a little more see-through. Um, so we can kind of go over the printing process when you're working with an FDM printer. So essentially the first thing you're starting with, let me see if I can pull it up. First thing you're starting with is a 3D model. Now if these 3D models can be designed uh, in various types of CAD programs, there are some for more for sculpting programs that allow you to kind of work with a ball of clay uh, and mess around with it. So I can kind of, I'm going to bring in this sphere. So this is Mesh Mixer. This is just kind of an Autodesk program that's used for editing more 3D models, not truly 3D designing. Uh, but it can be used for that. So we're going to go into the sculpting program. So now, these programs like that, will essentially you start with a ball of clay. Well, if you can imagine, it's like a ball of clay, essentially. And you're going in here, and you can kind of pull parts out. You can make a smiley face if you want. It allow, it's more for organic pieces, so if you're trying to do like a facial structure or trying to replicate something like that, animation, they'll use a program similar to, you know, this. Uh, so you'll see that's more of the 3D design. So like say you already have a 3D model, we're not really going to use that one because it's not that good. Um, yeah, let's see this. So this is uh, basically someone had a mount they wanted us to make for a GoPro. Um, so essentially, we just take this, it's called an STL file, is what most 3D models are out, but it varies depending on the technology you're using. So we bring it into this program. Now, this program that you see right here is called Cura. Now, Cura is essentially what we, a slicer program. Now, these slicer programs are what does really all the hard work. You know, it takes your 3D model that you've already designed. Essentially, you bring it into this program, and it, it uh, based off the settings you choose, the printer you're working with, it creates instructions for the printer to use. So we have this object right here. I have to print this piece. Okay? So now because everything goes layer by layer, you really want to avoid having overhangs. So we're going to orientate. We're going to orientate it so that this side is flat on the piece, right? So it's building up. You're not really going to, oh, quite the opposite. So you just can, you're allowed to kind of rotate the print based off the orientation and strength. Because when you think about it with FDM printing, if everything's printed layer by layer, most of the strength you have is kind of, as uh, is, is, uh, basically, so let me see if example, can I get like the nylon print for example? Can you grab the nylon? Yep. Yeah. Thank you for that. So now the nylon is printed upwards this way, right? So you have it layer upon layer upon layer building. So now most of the strength is going to be coming in from the top and the bottom because essentially you have the layers pressing against each other, you're not really gonna have any separation. So if I need this part to be stronger, obviously from the, this, this orientation, then maybe when you're printing it, 
uh, based off what the model is and how it worked, you might want to change the orientation. Also for uh, models a little more intricate, uh, I was kind of talking about support structures a little bit, but I didn't go too much into it. Um, we can kind of see this. Say you have a part that's very intricate for FDM printing. Because everything's printed layer by layer, say you have an overhang and you know a section similar to this, or up here, or even this piece right here. It's essentially going to start printing that over air. Now, gravity obviously is not going to let that work. So what FDM printers tend to do, I mean, uh, what most FDM printers tend to do is print support structures out of the same material. So say we're using PLA, PLA support grid structures will be uh, generated right through there. So we can kind of actually, uh, let's, let's go in, oh, it's already, so let's go in here. Okay, so this basically is what it looks like, right? And now it allows you to see where support structure structures are going to be generated in that blue section right there and where the model is. So now we can see that support structures will be generated there. So this is not really the best uh, orientation you want to print because you want to avoid support structures. Uh, but just for demonstration purposes, this is kind of what support structures look like. Now, after, as soon as it's done printing, you can just pull these materials right off. Sometimes you might have to sand it down to give it a nice finish. But just in general, you want to avoid them with FDM printing. Now, this printer that I have here, the start printer, uh, you can kind of see, uh, it's actually a little harder to see. Um, basically, it has one extruder. So one extruder just means basically the material, only one material can be used at one time. Right? Now there are some printers out there that actually are able to use multiple, multiple types of materials. So you can have two extruders. Now what this allows for is essentially to have one, you can have one material printed in nylon or say a, a very industrial uh, material and you can have the support structures printed in a soluble material. So as soon as you're done you can make a super intricate part uh, and then you can just set it in water or whatever kind of uh, uh, basically solvent uh, to get rid of the support structures so you're not really worrying about the part. Because there are certain prints like for example we can look at this piece right here. You know, it's about 45 degree angle, so it doesn't really need support structures as much. But there are certain parts where it's very, very fragile, you can see, where if you print it with support structures, it might be hard to remove those structures without damaging the actual object. So that's why you really want to, that's why soluble support is becoming a very big thing, and it's going to be really part of the future uh, of FDM 3D printing. Uh, because not having to worry about uh, soluble supports would be a huge, a huge factor uh, for 3D printing. Now. Let's, let's go. So this is a slicer. So we're going to kind of go over a couple of the, uh, I don't know how much you guys are going to be using 3D printers, but just kind of go over the couple of the settings that are mainly used with FDM printers. So the first one we're going to go over is layer height. Layer height is the main determinant, that basically determines the quality, right? So uh, essentially that's how thick each of those layers you see on each print is. Uh, high quality is about 100 microns or 0.1 millimeters. Uh, standard quality is about 200 microns. Now you're able to con completely control the actual uh, quality of the print based off that. You also have uh, shell thickness, so that's how thick the outside of the print is. There are times where you need a functional part and times where you don't need a functional part, where if you need one, you might want to change the uh, actual outside thickness to increase the, uh, the impact resistance. Uh, infill, now I don't know if I have a good example of infill. Basically, when these prints are uh, generated, I can see if I can show you. Essentially, if you look in these sections right here, you can see what looks like a grid structure. It's much more uh, visible in a larger object, but we're going to work with this one. Uh, essentially, this is called infill. These prints are not always printed uh, completely solid. You know, sometimes they have grid structures on the inside to save material costs and save time because 3D printing at this point in time tends to take a little while. Uh, so now this infill, you can control basically the density of an object. So if you need something 100% solid, then you would work with something like that. You look at aerospace, you look at all these other uh, areas like, for example, printing parts for drones. Uh, you don't really want a heavy, uh, heavy part, so you can always control the infill so that you still leave uh, make sure structural uh, integrity without using too much material. And you can always play around with those settings. Um, retraction. And then you can just uh, completely control whether you want support, touching build platform, where you want the supports, where you can manually choose, okay, this spot I know is going to be a little more difficult. I want to add extra support to there. Dual extrusion. If you have the dual extrusion printer, you can kind of mess with that and edit that. Um, Build platform adhesion. Now there are certain times where essentially when you're using a, a material and essentially it, it, one of the most common things is it warps. That just means the plastic is uh, essentially stick, trying to pull into itself. Uh, so best, it, I don't know if I have a good example of warping per se. You can kind of see on certain prints the corners will kind of pull up on itself. Now to avoid this you can add different kind of uh, build platform adhesions. Uh, let's, let's go with a, a raft. 
So say you have an object that doesn't have that much surface area on the build platform and you want to increase that so not only does it stick but it also uh, improves the safety of your print. You can generate what's called a raft which is just a solid part uh, kind of very similar to support structures that you can just pull off as soon as the print is done. Uh, there are other ones where instead of printing on top of an object you can just expand whatever uh, surface area your object already has and that's called a brim. Right? So it's not really building anything under the object more expanding what the object already has. Okay? So those are kind of most of the settings you have when you're building an object, right? Uh, so let's see if I can kind of plug this in. So now we're going to go over basically uh, how the printing process works when, when using the printer itself. If you don't mind, would you, is there space to put that in? So now this is the start printer, like I said, it's one of the more starting printers. Now it, everything is just basically manual with this, okay? So usually the first step when you're working with a printer like this is you want to really load and unload the material. Uh, now this one comes as a kit, but I already assembled it because that would take a little while to kind of assemble it in front of you. Uh, but essentially, the material is already loaded, but the first thing you want to do is you want to heat up the extruder. Uh, because you need to be able to heat up the extruder for the material to actually move through this hot end. Okay, so I already heated it up, but we can kind of go over. So basically this one has the function to preheat PLA. So it's essentially going to go to about 190 degrees, heat up to about the temperatures you're working with. Uh, so you can both load, unload material. Uh, say you want to make sure it flows right before you start a print, which is what I want to kind of do. Uh, that's what it's going to do. So it's, it's going to be a little boring process right now. It's more a waiting game, waiting for this to actually heat up. Okay? Uh, but while it kind of does this, um, basically the next step you want to do is calibration. Uh, now the main calibration with a printer like this is you want to calibrate the bed platform. So the printing bed that you're working with, you want to make sure that's always kind of perpendicular to the extruder. You want to make sure it, it's even and not offset because if it's offset, your printing, your print either comes out offset or essentially your levels don't work right. Because if you can imagine, these printers are working with, you know, 0.2 millimeters. So being offset by a little bit can completely change and uh, cause your print to fail. So this one, essentially you have knobs underneath the build platform. So you, it's a little harder to see, but there are four knobs underneath this build platform. You're essentially uh, going through those uh, and playing around in between the, uh, the nozzle. So you're, you basically move the build platform to about each corner and you're adjusting the nozzle based off the distance between, uh, your bus you're adjusting the build platform based off the distance between the bottom of your nozzle and, and obviously the build platform. You want to make sure they're all about the, the height of one, uh, one layer. It kind of takes a little while to get used to, and it's a very tricky process. This is probably one of the hardest parts of 3D printing. Well, not 3D printing, but starting a print, making sure that everything is leveled. Um, so it's either eyeballing it. Um, sometimes you can get like, oh, sorry. The question was, um, do you just eyeball it when it comes to leveling and calibrating the build platform? Uh, depending on the printer, uh, some have automatic detectors where you know the nozzle gets to a certain point and it just, it just tells you to adjust it upwards or downwards. Uh, for this specific printer, um, you either are doing it by eye, which is a little harder. I tend to have like an index card or something basically about the thickness of what you want to go for. And you can essentially slide that underneath the nozzle until you get the right drag or the right height you're looking for and adjusting based off that. Um, so I don't really have an example right now with the business card, but um, actually, yeah, so you basically, oh, perfect. So essentially, you know, you want to, let's start with this uh, front, front left corner, right? So everybody can kind of see. Uh, and you're literally just taking a, an index card, going right underneath the extruder, and getting a feel for it. Now this one's a little thick, but essentially I just want to push it under, and if you feel it's too close or too far, you know, you're just adjusting that knob based off of it. Uh, and then you just go piece by piece. Um, to make, oh, is that still plugged in? Yeah, okay, that's fine. Oh, well, you just, you can just put that on that side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so you just continue to go by, by each piece until you feel it's a good, I kind of already calibrated before I came because it takes a little while and it's a little kind of a boring process in my opinion. So, um, you just go to each corner. Now, some printers, you know, will have two on the front, one on the back. It really varies by the printer you're using, you know? This one is more manual. Others will actually move the extruder based off the point it wants you to measure. It's a little actually too close. 
So we're going to adjust that. Um, and then, as soon as you're done, that's it. Oh, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, so that's more the calibration process for these. Now, one of the most common, we kind of go over the common issues with a 3D printer using an FDM printer. Uh, essentially, you're melting plastic and building an object. Uh, if you could imagine, you're going to get a lot of clogs. The plastic is going to have problems with the cooling and heating of it. Uh, now, depending on the printer you use, that really depends on how often you have to deal with these. But sometimes you're going to have plastic actually stuck in that extruder where it's maybe you used the wrong material, printed it at the wrong temperature, and now you have like a giant glob in there. Now for stuff like that, you can always just basically remove the material itself. Uh, you could push it through a spike, whatever it might be. Um, give me one second. I'm expecting this to actually heat up. We're just going to heat this up so I can kind of move the material. So yeah. So you just basically tell it to heat up uh, kind of what it was supposed to do before. Um, but yeah, for clogs, essentially you, there are a, done, a ton of different methods to clear a clog depending on the printer you use. For this specific one, um, the best methods are usually just to simply remove the material or if you can't, just heat it higher than the temperature the plastic would normally melt at so it kind of have more of a liquidy consistency so it makes it a little easier to pull out the material. Uh, and you just use a spike. Um, I've used acupuncture needles to go up through the nozzle because it's, it's about 0.4 millimeters for the size of the nozzle, so you can go up through there to remove the material. Uh, and then just use like a spike of sort to essentially, it's going to be a little harder to remove this right now, to essentially remove this material out. Yeah, so it's still heating up, so it's not going to really move. Uh, but yeah, if you want to adjust the material at all, you really have to heat it up to about that temperature. Uh, and that's kind of more the, the steps to start when you first start printing. Um, it's going to take a bit of time to heat up. Um, how much time do we have left? Okay, so um, basically when it starts printing, the biggest part of a print is making sure that first layer goes down nicely. You want to make sure that it's even everywhere, because if it's not even, then you might have to adjust the leveling. Uh, you want to make sure that the consistency of the material is coming out right. Uh, because say you know the material looks like it's a little patchy, that might mean they're a clog. Or say it's too close to the bed. Um, but if that first or two first two layers come out right, that's how you would know a print is going to go pretty well. Um, it's going to take a bit of time to, to go, but no question. yeah. Uh, so you know, you mentioned a lot of software and uh, hardware. Yes. Uh, and it sounds uh, pretty expensive. So what's the you know maybe the free stack and uh, the cheap uh, <laughs> printer type that you can get uh, you know, just to get started? Well, I mean, th I'd say this one. Uh, oh, sorry. He was asking what, you know, a lot of this stuff sounds a little more expensive, so what is kind of a starter printer the, the best one to kind of get into? Uh, so that's why I say the start printer, actually. That's what we named it for. Uh, this one is $99. So um, when you're looking at a 3D printer, it's really not going to get cheaper than that. To be honest, that's probably some of the cheapest you can go because you're paying for a certain amount of quality of parts. And you know, if you get a complete, like, if you're not getting the right quality of parts, then you're not going to be able to print at a decent enough uh, quality. And it's not going to print consistently. So I'd say $99 is a good start. After that, you know, you can move in increments of like, you know, 200. By about 1,000 to 2,000, you can get a pretty solid printer. Above that, I mean, it keeps going, you know? Like the software, like the CAD? CAD, you can find, I use almost all CAD, free CAD programs. There are a ton. Autodesk offers a couple cool ones. Um, it's called Fusion 360 is a cool one to start out with. Um, it's just a parametric program. So you're essentially building objects based off constraints. So for more mechanical pieces, it's probably a good one to look at. Another one I've used in the past is called Onshape. Onshape is more just uh, a cloud-based program, but it's still the same idea. Uh, Fusion 360 is more the truer free one, uh, but those are two good ones to look at. To be quite honest, when it comes to 3D printing, it was started more, at least on the consumer basis, off of open source. So you're going to be able to find free programs for design, free programs for slicing. Cura itself is a free slicer program. So you can use it whatever, whatever printer you choose. You can build your own printers if you want. There are a ton, a ton of different designs to be able to use online if you want to look at it. You know, uh, we as a company work more with either like a kit like this or more of the pre-built ones, or at least something along those lines that are based off the open source ones. But I know a lot of people that build their own. I had a guy uh, come into the store. He was building he was living in Brooklyn, he built his own six foot tall Delta printer in his house. So it, it's definitely possible if you want. It takes obviously a little more time if you're building it yourself. Uh, but at this point, you're looking at least 99. If you really want something of quality and use a lot of different materials, then it's going to have to go above that. Okay. Yep. Could you just speak quickly about, like I say, uh, designs you can get online so you're not, you know, you're not drawing? Yeah, okay. So um, 
Now when it comes to a 3D model, say you have a printer and you don't really, you're not that good at designing yet, there are a lot of actual libraries of uh, free to download 3D models. Now one of the ones that I most commonly use is My Mini Factory. Now essentially, it's just a, it's a, a library of uh, free to use like models that you can download and print yourself, but it's all made specifically for 3D printing. Because a lot of these libraries you'll find 3D models for, like for uh, animation, printing, and a whole sort. So you kind of have to sort through it yourself. But uh, this one uh, is more for like printing. So like, you know, just about any kind of mechanical pieces, cool vases, a lot of stuff you see around here that I actually passed out is almost all on my mini factory so you can download it yourself. Okay. Um, and just, I'll take a, uh, a couple more minutes to really talk about the applications of 3D printing and where it's kind of going as a future. So like I said, you know, it's gonna, you're going to see a lot more dual extrusion printers, so you don't really worry about support structures. Um, where it's kind of already at right now, you can see making low-cost prosthetic hands. You know, in the medical field, it's becoming huge for stuff like that because you can make a hand that costs $50, you know, uh, and for people that really can't afford to have the traditional $1,000 uh, prosthetics, it's really cool for that. Or even just customized and personal uh, medical applications for patient information or even just planning surgeries, you'll see a lot of doctors. I know Mount Sinai is already starting to use uh, different kinds of technologies like that. You look at it in architecture, we work with a lot of architects when it comes to, they already basically design the, the building itself, so it's just a matter of, you know, optimizing it for 3D printing and then building it. So basically any kind of prototyping and even for certain materials, you know, the end production, it's really good for. Um, I mean, you'll see stories, obviously, I know NASA itself is working with 3D printing because it'd be an awesome idea to be able to use the materials on Mars or whatever planet it might be and build whatever you need. Uh, I know on the space station, they already have a 3D printer uh, similar to an FDM style, where essentially they can use one material and build whatever tools you need. And now that's awesome for a place where you don't have access to it. I know they're bringing like 3D printers out to Africa where essentially they can use it to make, you know, prosthetic hands, use it to make whatever tools they need without needing, you know, manual. Because before uh, 3D printing, it was a very big process of casting, injection molding, and other methods of manufacturing that it really is more about mass manufacturing and not customization uh, and having one or two prints out. Uh, but that's kind of where I see it, I see it going. It's just me starting to use in almost every industry. Uh, do we have any more questions? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. What applications are you using? And then as far as, I didn't understand what they were printing. Okay. So um, the question that he had was um, what applications are they using in the medical field? Uh, so I can kind of go over the, they're using different, Obviously, there are a ton of applications in the medical field because you have different levels of it. So like what I was talking about, the low cost uh, level, you have like printing out prosthetic hands and things along those lines where it's just using the lower cost plastic to, to build something more customized for those that can't afford something uh, traditional. But you look at the higher end, the mid, I guess the higher end, you're using more of the industrial 3D printers to essentially, uh, so f say for example, um, you have, uh, someone has a heart condition, right? And doctors need to really want to be able to, they already visualize it 3D on a computer, but to be able to have a physical model uh, has proven and shown that people, people love that and it will improve actually the quality of the surgeries, whatever it might be. So they're using actual, like the industrial printers to actually print in multiple colors so you can see like an artery, you can see the heart with arteries, whatever it might be, and it can be patient specifically. Because when we go to the hospital, we're already getting these CT scans, we're already getting these other scans, and it's literally perfect for 3D printing because I've done it myself. You could take those CT scans I took one of my shoulder and I printed it. So you can take those and really just maybe clean it up a little bit because I mean scanning isn't perfect just yet, but you could take that and directly print that. So um, also it's being used, you know, for surgery. For like actually, it's not really, I mean for dental surgery, they're using actual uh, implants and kind of guides more for it. Uh, for, uh, for just practicing, they're using it, you know, uh, they're using it like to design, okay, this is what his heart will look like. Let's work on here or let's kind of surgery, like plan the surgery. Mm -hmm. Biomechanics. Yeah, yeah. So it is all bio. That's mostly biomechanics. Now, I actually didn't mention this, but they do have bioprinters out there. So, you know, you hear about it. Uh, Organovo is one of the bigger companies out there doing it. Um, they're essentially, you know, printing like ears and things similar to that. So you're, you're actually able to take your own cells or whatever cells uh, of whatever object it is. Um, stem cells are usually the best because they can... Uh, generate into whatever cell you want, and you can print, you know, body-specific organs. Maybe not right now, it's not at that level, but if you can imagine somewhere in the future being able to print your own skin for your own graft, or say, kidney failure, that's fine, we'll print your new kidney, you know? That's far, far, far in the future uh, because more research needs to be done, but kind of just looking at the basis of it. They're already able to, you know, print different kinds of organs, and even when it comes just to testing, you know, because traditional uh, testing when it comes to the medical field, you're working on a petri dish. You're seeing cells in a 2D plane. 
that's not how they are in our body. So seeing, being able to see them in a 3D plane and test different types of, you know, materials on them. For, I know L'Oreal's doing something with makeup, testing their makeup on different kinds of stuff like that. So it, it's going to really bring a, a new, it's going to revolutionize the medical field when it comes to not only testing, but also just actual, uh, actual uh, helping people with that stuff. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. You mentioned the soluble structures. Yeah. I was just wondering, uh, what material is that actually printed with if you want to use it in conjunction with like a typical uh, plastic? Like okay. So, so his question was, um, when it comes to the soluble, uh, soluble materials, which I mentioned a little earlier, what materials are we using for that? Now, there are a lot of different kinds of uh, materials. It depends on, like, say your main material is PLA. One of the most common ones I've seen for PLA uh, is using PVA. Now, PVA, it dissolves in water. Uh, so you could print with PLA, use PVA as soluble support, throw it in water. A couple hours, it's gone. Other ones, another common one is hips. Um, now, hips, you can print just standard. You don't have to dissolve it. But it's really good for printing with ABS because it essentially will dissolve in like more of a lemon uh, uh, solvent that you, yeah yeah uh, it's, I don't remember the name off the top of my head but yeah something acidic basically to, uh, to use that and the best use case for a soluble would be if you would otherwise be printing on air and you want to avoid that and then have a, a structure in place and then dip it in water or an acid and have it go away afterwards essentially so, so his question was um, the main use I guess for soluble supports um, uh, more for like doing uh, just basically yeah, for generating support structures. I mean, right now, uh, soluble su supports, that's the main thing that's being used for. Obviously, you can make an object if you want something to dissolve in water afterwards. Obviously, you can always print it like that. Uh, but, you know, you can print in the same material. So say you're printing with PLA, you can always print support structures in PLA, the same material, right? Uh, but sometimes, you know, for certain objects, like I said, if you don't really want the support to mess up the, the finish of the object, or say you have something very complex where, say you printed that Mobius strip where uh, essentially you printed it, so getting support structures out of that is close to impossible, really, if it's very enclosed and you have a hollow inside. So being able to print uh, support structures that are soluble, it, it allows you to do way more complex structures without worrying about the, the main constraints and limitations of 3D printing right now. Okay. Uh, is that everybody's questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you guys for coming to this workshop. Uh, like I said, definitely check out iMaker, the website for different kinds of 3D printers. We also have meetups in the Lower East Side at our store for different kinds of 3D technology, you know, fashion, whatever, medical, all that kind of stuff. Okay? Thank you. Uh, and it could have used way more data, right? So there's all of you. There's my business card. It's hard for most of them.